In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's great to be with all of you at the beginning of this new month, as well as the first Friday of the month. So it's great to be with all of you. And as always, we like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many wonderful titles. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. Also in the Hail Holy Queen, we invoke Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's turn to Mary and ask Mary to help us to get closer and closer to God. And as uh, mentioned, this is the first Friday of the month, which we'd like to honor, of course, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ under the title of the Most Sacred Heart. So let's, uh, let's say the prayer that Mary loves most, and that prayer is the Hail Mary, together, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, my friends, let's turn our gaze to our spiritual director. What a great privilege it is to have as our spiritual director the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit also has many wonderful titles. Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of the soul. Holy Spirit is also known as our consoler. He's also known as our counselor and sanctifier. He who makes us holy. And St. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans with these words, he says, we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans, groans, so we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's pray the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. As we say, come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. Saint Joseph, 
pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Yes, my friends, the family that prays together stays together, and a world at prayer is a world at peace. It's great to be with all of you, and as always, as always, I will be praying for all of you, and I'll be praying for you all in the greatest of all prayers. And that prayer is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. There's actually no greater prayer in the whole world than the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So I'd like to place all of you on the altar, and it's great to have Bob and Sophie back who couldn't make it yesterday. It's great to have you today. And I'd like to place all of you on the altar. And offer these following prayers. First, I'd like to pray that all of us would be open to the workings of the Holy Spirit. That's right, all of us would be open to the workings of the Holy Spirit. And that we would be able to say this prayer, Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention will be, I'd like to pray in a special way, for our families. For the conversion of our family members for the sanctification of our family members and for the salvation of our family members. Our Lord says very clearly, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you besides. And my other intention will be, I'd like to pray in a special way for those who will be dying sometime in the course of the day. That's right. That's right. So, I'd like to pray that those who are dying, they would open their hearts to God's infinite mercy and love. So, my friends, it's always great to be with all of you.
I'd like to just start off by telling an interesting story on divine providence. Then we can move into the first Friday in the readings. Years ago, there was a, a woman parachutist. Her name was Joni. And they, she dropped from the plane. And what happens in time when she had fallen down, her parachute stopped functioning. And then as she fell, there's a... Um, an emergency emergency parachute that you pull if the first one is not working. And that worked only partially. And then she hit the ground at very, very fast. And what happened was she fell on top of, of a pile of fire ants and the fire ants bit her and that sent a message to her adrenal adrenaline glands that pumped that pumped blood to her heart at a super rapid pace and as a result of that she didn't die and I was thinking about that story how you know, none of us want to be bitten by fire ants with their venom. But actually, falling upon the, the pile of those fire ants in 500 bites signaled the adrenal glands to pump the adrenal glands to her heart. So her heart pumped super fast, and that saved her. So I just thought I'd tell you that story because it's a story of divine providence. Divine providence on how God, God can intervene in millions of different ways to help us in one way or another. And often what happens in our lives, my friends, what seems to be often a tragedy can sometimes turn into a victory when we look back in retrospect. What seems to be a tragedy can sometimes be a victory. When I preside over funeral masses, When I preside over funeral masses, I choose for the gospel reading, the gospel of St. John chapter 11. And I'll read that and I'll say how Jesus turns a tragedy in, into a victory. If you're not aware of it, John chapter 11. Is we see Jesus turns a tragedy into, into a victory. John chapter 11 is the story of uh, three family members who suffered. There was a tragedy, but Jesus turned it into a victory. This is the story of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. So I'm telling you this story that we can maybe just look back in our lives and thank God for his abundant blessings, even during the painful moments in our lives when we suffered very much. 
John chapter 11, Mary and Martha send Jesus a note. And they, the note they sent him is, Lord, Lord, the one that you love is suffering. And very sick. So Jesus says to Mary and Martha by means of a message that he uh, he said, I'm going. He's far away. However, when our Lord arrives, when our Lord arrives, Mary and Martha are in tears because their brother Lazarus has already, he's already died. And in tears, and in tears they say, Lord, if you were here, my brother would not have died. Jesus is moved to the very depths of his heart and we have one of the shortest sentences in the Bible it says Jesus wept they, and he says where is he buried and they point to a cave where Jesus was where Lazarus was buried and Jesus is Believe me, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he die, he will live forever. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. They said, we believe that he'll be raised on the last day. So Jesus arrives at the cave and tells them to remove the stone. They said, well, Lord, he's already, Lord, he's already in the tomb. And there's already going to be a smell. He's been there for four days. Jesus says, push back the stone. So they push back the stone and our Lord raises his voice in a loud voice and says, Lazarus, come out. And this man, Lazarus, who was dead for four days, comes out of the tomb. And he's given to Mary and Martha. Jesus turns this tragedy, this tragedy of death, into victory. He turns a tragedy into a great victory. And when I'm doing the funeral masses, cannot deny that death, the loss of loved ones, it's not easy. It's not easy. But that story of Lazarus returning from death to life is a teaching for us as followers of Christ to believe in what is called the Paschal Mystery. The Paschal Mystery refers to Christ, his passion, death, and resurrection. And that happened with Lazarus. He died, but our Lord did bring him back to life. So I'm presiding over funerals, I'll often say, this is our hope. Even though our loved one has passed away, we as Catholic Christians believe, we believe that 
death is not the last word. Rather, the last word, Jesus Christ, is truly risen from the dead. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Remember hearing a story years ago. These children in middle school in their English class were told that they had to write a three-page composition on a person living that they admired most. This was probably a good 40 years ago. And one little girl wrote a three-page paper on Michael Jackson. You probably remember him. A famous rock and roll a famous rock and roll superstar started off with Jackson 5 then he he became a singer on his own another boy wrote a three page composition on Michael Jordan probably remember Air Jordan one of the greatest greatest basketball players that ever lived Another boy wrote a three-page paper on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The teacher publicly rebuked that child and said, I told you to write a three-page composition on someone who's still living. And the little boy said, Jesus died, buried, but he rose from the dead and he lives forever. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. I love that story, don't you? It's a great story. It's a great story. So I invite all of us to rewind the film of our life. Rewind the film of our life and be aware of the fact that Christ is the victor. He's the victor. So my friends, as several of you have already written, or posted rather, we're into the, the first Friday of the month which is dedicated to the most sacred heart of Jesus. And in our studio here, you can see on, on the wall, there's a beautiful image of the most sacred heart of Jesus. The most sacred heart of Jesus. Now, I think it's worth worthy of note to explain what did Jesus ask of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque have there in the corner also with the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Well, Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque and he said, Behold the heart that loves so much and receives only indifference, coldness, and gratitude in return. Console my heart. So Jesus told her Thursday night from 11 to midnight to make a holy hour of reparation. That's right. To make a holy hour of reparation Thursday from 11 to 12, that's when we commemorate when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane in his agony. And the apostles fell asleep. But also our Lord, but also our Lord said to St. Margaret Mary Le Cook, to get in the habit of making the, the nine first Fridays.
you have the nine first Fridays and the five first Saturdays. I repeat the nine first Fridays and the five first Saturdays. The nine, the f nine first Fridays, Jesus said to St. Margaret Mary LeCook, a good confession around the first Friday of the month. Then he wanted her to go to Mass. Of course, it may be easier for her than us because she was a religious nun in the visitation convent founded by St. Vincent, St. Francis de Sales, and to participate in Mass fully, actively, and consciously, and to make a communion, to receive Holy Communion, but to make what is called a communion of reparation. a communion of reparation. In other words, to make a communion in reparation for the many sins of the world. And our Lord made the promise that those who do make the nine first Fridays of the, non of the month making a communion of reparation, then he'll be present for them when they die, so that they will die in the state of grace. They will die in the state of grace. And as Mary Jo has pointed out, when people are dying, it's a very good practice to pray the chaplet of divine mercy. To pray the chaplet of divine mercy. So our Lord promised this would be to St. Faustina Kowalska. May that promise that those who Pray the Chapa Divine Mercy. For someone who's dying, someone is dying that God will intervene for that person who's dying and have mercy on that person that's dying. Now, reparation, basically what it means to repair for the damage done. That's what it means. To repair for the damage done. In our perseverance conversation, we often talk about prayer and different types of prayer. In the past, I've given you an acronym, A-C-T-S. I've given you several, ac I like to preach and teach through acronyms. A-C-T-S. A stands for adoration. C stands for contrition. T stands for thanksgiving. S stands for supplication. Of those four letters, the C, contrition, is the one that is closely related to reparation. Reparation is related to the moral virtue of justice, giving to each his due. So, 
if I steal something, a hundred dollars, I have the moral duty to return that hundred dollars. If I break your window, it's incumbent upon me to try to restore that window. If I hurt you, I should try to apologize and repair for the damage. If you lend me a book, I have an obligation to restore the book that you've lent to me. All of these are concrete examples of what is called reparation. Of reparation. Even when you go to confession, when you go to confession, hopefully we go to confession at least once a month, is there are five classical steps to make a good confession. And that would be that we are sorry for our sin We're sorry for our sins. Well, we first examine our conscience is number one. Then we're sorry for our sins. Then we confess our sins to the priest. And then after we... We confess our sins to the priest, then the priest gives us absolution. And then after absolution, it's incumbent upon us to carry out what is called the penance. So that carrying out the penance in confession would be that of reparation. So the question would be which first Fridays and Saturdays? Well, you start you start whenever you want. So you can start today. So if you're going to be starting the first Friday today, so that would be. December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August. If you start today, you'll finish in the month of August. And it's true what uh, Julie is saying. Confession is obligatory at least once a year, but those who are those who are pursuing a life of holiness will want to go more often to the sacrament of confession. We'll feel that one once a year is really not enough. And if it happens that we fall into serious sin, glad some of you are bringing up these questions. If we fall into more, if we fall into serious sin. We fall into serious sin. We call it mortal sin. Then we should try to go to confession as soon as possible. Some are asking how often. Once a month, I think, is a good idea to go at least once a month. Some even go every week. Some people are posting even, they go on a weekly basis. But given that many of you are asking questions on this topic today, uh, we don't want to play 
I mentioned we don't want to we don't want to be playing Russian roulette with our salvation. We don't want to jeopardize our eternal salvation. And giving talks in many places, in many times, in many circumstances. When I'm giving the talks on the spiritual exercises, I usually give a brief catechesis on sin. Pope Pius XII says that the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. I repeat, Pope Pius XII says that the sin of the century The sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. And then I try to just go through what is what are the conditions of a mortal sin. It's good for us to know that. Because by committing a mortal sin, my friends, By committing a mortal sin, we actually lose the grace of God. We actually lose the grace of God by committing a mortal sin. You would be surprised how few Catholics really know what that is. Mortal means fatal. It's like you, someone on the freeway gets into, into a fatal accident which results in death. That be an analogy of mortal sin. So, and I'm saying this, if you're aware of committing a mortal sin, you shouldn't wait. Don't play Russian, rul Russian roulette with your salvation. There are actually three conditions. And that would be grave matter, grave matter, then the second would be full knowledge, and then the third would be full consent of the will. It's good that you remember those three, those are the three conditions that constitute a mortal sin. Even though perhaps some of you have heard this often, it's a good idea to refresh your memory, and you can maybe catechize others. The three constitutive elements of a mortal sin would be would be that of grave matter, full knowledge. and full consent to the will. If we're responsible for that, then we would have committed what is called a mortal sin. I'll give you an example. An example that's very common today. Of course, the heart and center of every week is Sunday. Where we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ every Sunday. Sunday. Okay, it's Sunday. You, your husband, and your two young adult children. You get up late. It's Sunday. You mosey over to Denny's to have a brunch. All the time you know that there's masses in the parish at 8 and 10 and 12 and 2 
and 5. In a nearby church, there's a Mass actually 7 p.m. You're keenly aware of those many Mass opportunities as well as Saturday in the evening. You're aware of that. But you and your family got up late. You moseyed over to Denny's to have a nice leisurely brunch. And it's already about 11.30. You know that there's a 12 o'clock Mass, which you could make it. But also there's a 2 o'clock Mass. So you with your husband decide just to go and uh, go out to the park. Your finish is 4 o'clock and you know that there's a 5 o'clock Mass and you say, well, let's, why don't we go to a movie? <clears throat> so by the time the movie's over, it's already 8 o'clock. So all of those Mass opportunities that you had, you rejected. So what do you have? There you have those three conditions. Going to Mass is something very serious. It's a matter of life and death. Mass is very important, my friends. It's a matter of life and death. Our salvation depends upon Mass and what happens in Mass, what we receive in Mass. Listen to the words of our Lord. In the Bread of Life Discourse, the Bread of Life Discourse, which you can find in John chapter 6. In which our Lord says, In which our Lord says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, but they died. Do not seek the perishable bread, but seek the bread that gives eternal life. And many people said, this is a very hard saying. Who can put up with it? This is a very hard saying. Who can put up with it? And they walked away. And as Jesus saw them walking away, he turned to the apostles and said, are you going to leave me too? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus said, didn't I choose all of you, but one of you is a devil. Referring to Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. So I'm trying to do today, my friends, is we're talking about the first Friday, but we're also talking about the whole concept of sin, I'm giving kind of a catechesis, a kind of a catechesis on the reality of sin and the reality of what is called mortal sin. Now and then it's good to revisit our, our catechism to get to know better and better what, uh, what the church teaches through the catechism, especially the catechism of the Catholic Church. So I'm going through my friends as we talk about the first Friday of the month 
in offering reparation to the most sacred heart of Jesus. We have the beautiful image in our studio here for you. We're talking about a communion of reparation, but we're also talking about the importance of confession related to communion. Confession related to communion. So, grave matter, missing Mass on Sunday, missing Mass on Sunday, there's a very serious obligation for us to go every Sunday. Now, if you're sick, you're excused. If you have your little child sick and you have to watch over your, your sick child, you're excused. If you have a 95-year-old mother who is sick with Alzheimer's and depends upon you, you're excused. Remember, once as a child in New York, there was a there was a snowstorm, there was, there was a blizzard, and we couldn't get out of the house. In that case, you're excused. If you're far from the church and you have no transportation whatsoever, you're excused. During the pandemic, because of the danger of contracting the coronavirus, sickness, the bishops, for about a year and a half, well, a good year anyway, excuse the people from going, but tell the people to try to follow the Mass online. And the bishops encourage the people to make what is called a, what is called a, a spiritual communion. <clears throat> If you have a mentally challenged child that might be autistic and would be very nervous that day, you could be excused from that also. But try trying to watch and follow Mass online. In a word, what we're really saying is we, we should really have a great desire to go to Mass. I even don't like to say mass obligation because we should really want to go to mass to be with the Lord. So there you have grave matter, full knowledge, you know it. You, you know that mass is very important as I'm teaching you right now. We're not ignorant over the importance of Mass, especially you who come to to be with me on Perseverance. You're, you're, you're pretty well educated, most, most of you. And then, grave matter, full knowledge, full will. You willingly, you willingly decide on purpose, I'm not going to go to Mass on Sunday. The example I gave you a couple minutes ago. You and your husband, you get up late with your adult children. You decide to go to Denny's. You have a leisurely meal. Then you go to the park. Then after the park, you go to a movie theater. All during the time you know, you know, you know, that there's Mass at 8, or, or Saturday evening is good enough for Sunday. And then 8 and 10 and 12 and 2 and 5, that's our Mass schedule. We have those six Masses, and we also have a Confirmation Mass simultaneous with the Mass at 10 in Spanish. Most churches in big cities have a wide variety of Masses that you can choose from. So be thankful. Be thankful for that. So, going back to the first Fridays, 
So if you do, if you start today, that would take us up to August. So you go to mass. You participate fully, actively, and consciously in the holy sacrifice of the mass. And Jesus said to Saint Margaret Mary Ella Cook. He said to her. He said to her, to offer up a communion of reparation. And I said reparation means to repair. And that means, of course, that we don't receive communion in mortal sin. That would be a sacrilegious communion responding to ibis. Quite the contrary, that when we go and receive communion, when you go and receive communion, you should always be in the state of grace. If you're aware of a mortal sin, go to confession before receiving Holy Communion. Otherwise, your communion could be a sacrilegious communion. That's right. Your communion would be a sacrilegious communion if you receive it in the state of mortal sin. So you offer your communion in reparation for the sins of the world. And there are so many. But I'll just mention one today. I'll just mention one today. And that would be The following, related to this whole topic of communion and mass and reparation, is the following. The biggest religious group, the biggest religious group in the United States, as well as in the Philippines, as well as in Europe, as well as in Latin America, the biggest religious group are Catholics, but non-practicing Catholics. Catholics that were baptized, most made their first communion and confirmation but they no longer go to Mass on Sundays. That's the biggest religious group. So if you're asking me what to offer reparation for, I would say offer reparation for those many people who do not go to Mass on Sunday. That's why in the United States there's a three years of three years trying to get people to have a heightened awareness of the importance of going to Mass and what the Eucharist and the Mass is. So offer Mass in reparation for our own lack of love for the Mass, but also for the many, many, many Catholics who no longer come to Mass on Sunday. So my, my friends, our time, time flies when you're in good company. Isn't that true? Time flies when you're in good company. I will pray for you in my Mass, and I'd like to give you my priestly, my priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Make sure that you share our message to many of your friends. Amen.